This interview is with Dom Rosick, the CEO of Minka. Minka has raised $24 million and they are building a open network that enables organizations to move money in real time. So the network aims to build and connect the world's balances through the web using shared and connected ledgers. Uh, Dom is very passionate, excited about the potential for crypto to influence the world of payments, but he realized that crypto has to integrate with our current existing payments infrastructure. So hence Minka. We talked about their early days, how they built the product before they had a customer, and then they just landed in Colombia, where Colombian banks were doing an RFP proposal, and they wanted to integrate one payment system together to have a settlement layer, kind of like Zelle, or you could think of Venmo. They won that contract. We talked about how they won that contract. It's such a small company compared to other monsters in the space. Bottom line, it just comes down to speed and being good at what you do, delivering. So they did that, they launched, it was successful. They raised a bunch of money and now they're on to the races doing this in other countries and other places. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. I learned a lot, hope you do as well. Here is Dom Rosick. All right, Dom, I'm excited to chat with you. You are the founder of Minka, which is based now where you are, started off in Colombia, uh, working in crypto. You guys have raised about 24 million is what I have down. Uh, give me the rundown. Tell me why you started it and what the problem or opportunity that you initially saw is and where you guys are generally today. Yeah, so I can start with the story of what happened when I came to Colombia. I'm here because of my, my wife and I have two beautiful daughters. And uh, so six, seven years ago, if I wanted to send a picture of my daughter, all I had to do is uh, get my phone, choose a phone number, send an image and send it right across the, the pond to my, to my parents. You know? So it was free, real time, and it was just a phone number. And then when I, I had to uh, pay my next door neighbor, we were buying some groceries and I tried to send him $5 uh, through the standard uh, payment system. It actually took three days. They asked me for a bunch of information and I ended up owing money to the bank. So I realized that something's definitely not right. And since I was uh, before in telecommunications industry and I, I really love payments and just got into the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole, I decided to, to dig, dig deeper and see what is actually going on. Why in uh, some parts of the world you can move money instantly and in parts like Colombia, basically cash is king and it takes forever to make a money transfer. And so generally on business to business transactions in Colombia, and I would imagine it's somewhat similar for surrounding countries. What's the default like payment processing? Are, there, are people using Stripe? Is there like sophisticated, maybe US-based payment processing or how does it look? Yeah. So, so when you look at our focus, when we started was basically P2P. I wanted to replicate this experience of, um, of sending money between two people using only a phone number. So when we checked how the payment space is, it's very local. There's a lot of local companies, but when we get dig deeper, you see that, um, even the protocols that we use for payments were done in the eighties or nineties and they're still users. So it's basically the file-based system. There's Visa and MasterCard and there's the local ACH, similar to the ACH in the US. And all of that is pre-internet and pre-Bitcoin, no? So the first problem was technology. Uh, everything was built around the core, which is the core processing, and then layers on top of layers like an onion. And the more you peel, because we had to peel, the more you cry. So that was our, our job, just to see what is what is behind. So so there's a very um, limited number of uh, foreign companies where mostly it's local, and it's very limited to few ways of moving money. So either it's account to account transfers and very low usage of credit cards which ends up with almost 85% cash in Colombia. So most people use cash and it's completely normal and usual to, to do it here. And so no Venmo type experience by default, people pretty much don't pay each other unless they're right next to each other. And then what, what's the, tell me more about Minka is it the approach crypto first is part of the way to get around the existing establishment of payments or how did you sort of think through integration versus yeah. branch off and build new? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a longer story. So, so we started off uh, with the idea that uh, let's say that Bitcoin is the settlement for the internet. So it's a great settlement mechanism, you know? but most of the payments are clearing. So we have a promise to pay in our IRU and most of the banks and interactions between institutions uh, is done through this clearing mechanism. You know? So we thought about scaling uh, Bitcoin. That was the first idea, but it was too early. We always come up with ideas too early. And um, we decided to pitch the idea to the Central Bank of Colombia 
and it was also too too advanced or too uh, eccentric for them, so they directed us to local ACH. Uh, long story short, we ended up on the RFP, and we won the RFP to modernize the payments industry. Industry. So in the last two years that we've been live, we were like really low profile. We integrated 17 banks, which is almost 80% of the banking system. And you have a service similar to Zelle or Venmo now, where you can send money instantly using a, a phone number. And uh, you can do that uh, by, by, without a cost. So, so this is the service that we provided. We are basically the rails. We see ourselves as more a payment protocol which allows those financial institutions and now other participants to integrate and now enable money to flow. That, that's what Minka does. So we're more a payments protocol building a new network. And were you the reason they did the RFP? The RFP is being request for proposal. And had, how did you, like, what, what, how did you win the RFP? Was it competitive? I'm curious about that process. I think it was like when you're starting and you don't know how things work, then, then you, you avoid all the big mistakes, you know? So. So we're going about against all the big ones. So of course, the big friend card companies, we went against ACI and CI, like all the big companies in the space. And since we didn't know that it's really complex, we told them if we can build a pilot in two weeks and make something work in two weeks, you should include us in the RFP, you know? So we did it. It was two weeks for us to send the first transfer and it worked for, for some miraculous reason. We already had the platform ready. And uh, then we went to the standard process and we're the best, uh, best proponent there and won the RFP. So it's been now two years from since then. We are expanding. We're working on some other countries, but I think Colombia is a start. There's very few people that know that, but the transfers are free in Colombia and we're opening up a lot of new use cases, some collection, money disbursements, even money streaming. There's so many new use cases being built on top of what, uh, what was founded uh, or started two years ago. No? This is a, it's a pretty big breakout moment to have. So you, you win an RFP to be the exclusive provider for effectively a Zelle, which is a yeah. like peer to peer network that's integrated to the banks. So you exactly. sort of have the ability to like create a reconciliation layer and then settle daily or you know, at some periodic interval. Um, so if I send you the idea being right, if, if you send me $20, I send uh, Jeremy $20, Jeremy sends you $20. At the end of the day, no money moves and you have this, this settlement layer separate from the banking layer, saving transaction costs and all sorts of costs under the hood yeah. for this 20 year old, 30 year old technology. Yeah. Winning so, this, yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah. So, so actually we started off with the idea and their idea was that we built on top of the existing rails, you know, so that we actually you reuse the system when we saw how it works and, and frankly, I didn't even know that it's that bad, but. Most of the systems that are file based and basically changing files, even the US today, like that's how the ACH works now. So we decided to build everything from scratch. We managed to convince the central banks to put the guarantees there. So in a way it works like a stable coin. The banks who are participating are pre, uh, 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 putting guarantees and those guarantees is what's, what is issuing this stable coin as we're using internally in the system. So in real time, we have the information about all the users, all the companies connected and all the banks. So it's a very unusual system where everything is real time. We have uh, real time information about all the participants and all the money movements in the country. No? And is that stored in a private database that you would have access to, or is that stored on chain somewhere? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. Since, since I'm a bit of a maximalist, I cannot say a lot of things because the team gets mad. Uh, we are, um, in a way it's a private blockchain. So we are inspired by the architecture of Bitcoin. We build our own platform. So we do, uh, actually what is interesting, most of the banks use, uh, Bitcoin compatible signatures to keep the keys inside the transactions. So they're all signing transactions, even their users. So there's almost like 3 million people in the country, which are using the same, same private keys to sign transactions. But then it goes through this uh, database, which in a way is private. And it's where all the data is stored about the users and transactions. The banks prefer not to publish it. We are doing anchoring to, to Bitcoin periodically, just to make sure that the hashes of the transactions are valid. And that's kind of our relationship to the, to the Bitcoin and blockchain space. So we see ourselves as a layer two, but in this case, which is interesting, it's a layer two on top of the central bank, not, uh, not on the Bitcoin mm. network as it was originally envisioned. Yeah. And what, what does it mean to, what did you say? Uh, you do what with Bitcoin reconcile it or are you? No. So, so we, we just, uh, build our own structure of transactions and periodically save it. So we have like periodic backup, let's say of transactions to, to proof of work system. So, so would you be posting, would you be posting a, a history of transactions to blockchain to the Bitcoin yeah. blockchain? 
Yeah, we're building our own Merkle tree and then it's uh, periodically posted to, to Bitcoin. So, so in a way we're anchoring the transactions just so we have, uh, uh, unmutable history. Yeah. I see. And so if somebody were to download the full Bitcoin node, the history of all transactions, your transactions would be in there. They can validate the hash, so they can they can download our transactions, check the Bitcoin blockchain, and they can uh, they can compare it to and see that the transactions are valid. No, so so banks don't even know it. Actually, what's interesting when we started this, and especially because we're using the same cryptography, we're chaining transactions, we learned a lot of the a lot of the components uh, in the work sessions. After we mentioned it three times, some of the people left. So we just stopped mentioning Bitcoin like two years ago because it was not a popular topic at the time and. Uh, Technology was also quite new and not so accepted from the side of the bank. So, so most of the banks don't even know what goes under the hood, but, uh, they know that mo money moves in real time, which is important. No? And, and do, do they, do they, when you say the banks don't know what goes under the hood, I would imagine that maybe the executives, the people making the decisions don't, but then they have a team, they must somehow audit or make sure this is, you know, works, right? Because it's effectively their reputation on the line. Um, is, is that how. Yeah, tell me, I'm, I'm curious how it's, it, they, what they do to participate or audit what's happening. Yeah, I think actually it's interesting because we, we uh, have very good support from the technical team. So they have a few things they need to do on their, our, their side. Since there was no like a standard how you communicate between two, two banks, uh, we used, uh, there's two components. One, uh, they need to sign on the transactions offline. So they need to sign it cryptographically and then they send it to the network that we're building. The way that they send it is that we, we convince them to develop the, uh, debit and credit endpoints. So in a way we can have read and write access to the banking course. And, um, uh, the reason why, why it's quite positive because first conciliation is practically unnecessary because you have the real time information between the banking course and the cloud. And second, the integration is quite simple since you're signing transactions and then sending them out, there's no need for like private tunnels. And there's a lot of infrastructure usually involved in building a payment system. So, so the feedback was actually really good on the technology. I think it's very well adopted, uh, between those banks and it's, it's spreading around the region. So based on the success we had in Colombia, we have several other countries that are already signed and we're replicating the model throughout the, throughout the region. And so the, the idea is that it's a, it's, it's stored crypto cryptographically, but there is just one database that you guys would have access to, but in order for someone to read or write, they need a, a key to, to write exactly. into it. And, and the opposition, like the web two way of doing this would be instead of a cryptographic key, it would be an API token. And that, yeah, exactly. so either way you have a way to validate that this is, you know, yeah. legitimate. So the difference is that you're basically signing each transaction. So for us to make a change in the database or for a bank to change the database, it's really hard. So it's the user who signs the transaction, then bank validates it. So if someone wants to hack the system, even if we don't have proof of work or the things that the, the other blockchains have, uh, it's really hard because we have few right now, it's almost 20, 30 million transactions that are signed. And it's really hard to make a change because there is a, there is a chain in the transactions, transaction stream. So, so there's a few things that, that, uh, was kind of a combination of let's make it acceptable enough to the banking industry and not use a native coin, which is example of some of the other projects we've seen. So, so it's easily digest it. And on the other side, let's, let's keep some of the security aspects that, that actually were great innovation from in, in the last 10, 13 years now. And from the bank's perspective, were these 17, 18 or so banks, were they pushing one way or the other? I mean, what's their, how do they look at this? They say, well, more people using our system, more, more people being able to move money between banks is better for everybody. So let's cooperate. And they don't really care about the blockchain aspect of it or what's their general disposition? Yeah, I think it's more like the main concern of the banks is the marketing act, uh, like the market aspect. So the reason why they push for the idea to have real time payments is to compete with cash. Like I said, 85% of the, uh, all transactions in Colombia are made in cash, maybe a bit less now with this system and a few changes uh, in the pandemic. So, so, uh, that was their main motivation, but also there was a uh, resistance. Not so much about the technology. I think the technology is quite interesting and especially if we get to the innovation side of the departments of the bank, they, they, they actually love the, the, to innovate. The, the main problem was that it started or it could compete with the traditional payment methods like uh, credit cards, because you can actually enable micropayments at a fraction of a cost that you would, uh, you would process a card payment. Uh, 
So, so we are enabling micropayments. There's a few hundred thousand businesses accepting um, payments directly through a phone. And uh, we're moving now to other use cases like payments disbursements and online payments, which, which, which will be quite a, quite a big change because in a way it's a digital cash, which then um, opens up a new market for, for the banks. So I think the main objection is like, how, where do I fit this? Could it cannibalize my existing revenues? And on the other side, um, uh, they want to reduce the use of cash. So there, there's a, there is an interest. Mm. And is a significant portion of the bank's revenue from the interchange on the credit cards, or is, is that what they're worried about cannibalizing? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, that's one segment. Uh, they also have very high fees for, for bank transfers. So bank to bank transfers. Oh can actually cost three to $4 here. It's similar to the US, US actually, no? And with this system, that part, which is P2P is actually free. So what we're seeing is that people didn't use it as often because of the cost and the uh, inconvenience. Now there's more and more people using uh, this type of transfers to, to move money. And that was the original idea, enable money to flow without any barriers. And, and what's the attitude, I guess, Colombia or other countries that you're seeing on the idea of the stable the currency, the, uh, you know, um, what was, what the, what's the term for this? The currency that's tied to the banks, you know, centralized uh, CBDC? US, CBDC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like, uh, there's a lot of conversation, but it's a very, uh, uh a topic that is still not mainstream now. So a lot of the banks, uh, central banks are actually piloting and this is, this is kind of where Minka is going. So our vision is to, to have a platform where anybody can issue their own currency. And they can move it freely between the participants now. So it could be for a clearing house like ACH, or it could be for a central bank, or it could be for a small fintech who is basically uh, managing the loyalty points. So, so we, we are very interested to work with the central banks, but it's still a very, uh, a very new topic. And uh, there's a lot of resistance to the idea. So we'll see, there's some countries who are leading in the region and investigating, doing pilots. Probably the sim most similar project to Colombia is PIX in Brazil. Um, is the payment system for Brazil, which is real-time payments. And that's probably the first step since Brazil was very successful. Colombia has very good numbers. There's more and more countries in the region that are looking first to enable real-time payments. And then down the line, probably go for something like, a, a central bank digital currency. Mm. Did, did your business model occur? Did you, did the business model happen? I mean, your general approach of, you know, RFP to build out the system for transaction. 0% fee transactions. Was it timing? Was this, it seems like timing has to play a massive role in this. Was it like, Hey, we just, this is an opportunity we see they're about to do, let's jump in and do it. Or did you from the onset say like, this is what I'm going to do. And Columbia is the best place to go. Yeah. So, so, um, I think we started like maybe even five years ago, R and D and searching what is money, trying to understand, uh, what money is, uh, what payments are, what banking is. And we kind of built the platform without any client. So we got some financing and I left my previous company. We're just like building it. Like if you build it, they will come. That was our, yeah. our, our philosophy, no? And, uh, when we saw the RFP and we were working at two companies at the time. So it looked like a right fit because everything's moving to real-time payments now. Uh, I think even the US, like Fed now is something that's quite a big topic. So the world is moving towards uh, real-time payments and we had a bit of a head start. So Minka is in a pretty good position that we already built a platform and probably too early, but now in the next one to three years, it is the time to, to, uh, to reap what we, what we basically saw now. And did you move to Colombia for this or were you already in Colombia? No, no, I, I met, uh, my wife who's Colombian and then I decided to move here. I actually moved for another company, which is the first Croatian unicorn Colombia Infofit. that was opening their offices around Latin America and I fell in love with Bogota. I fell in love with Colombia and decided to stay here. So it was a bit of an other way around. We build a platform. I decided I'm going to be here. So let's do something here. Let's change the country. Wow. It, what are your thoughts on, uh, uh, USBC, um, or, uh, you know, the, just the, the how do you think it should go? Like, should banks have, or should governments and countries have their own, uh, like centralized currency that they maintain? What are what some of the mistakes that might happen? And what do you think is like the successful pathway forward for countries and banks to think about this? Yeah. I mean, when you look at it, the banking system, didn't change a lot. Like the technology didn't change like from the 16th century, honestly, you no, know, because it was like double entry bookkeeping and that's what we have today. We just maybe digitalized some of it. No, 
And then we look at central banking. Uh, it started in the last century and also didn't change much. So, so um, central banks usually don't do low value payments and they don't go into the turf of the retail banks who actually issue money based on the guarantees they have in the central banks. So doing that step from actually um, being the, the, uh, like the someone of last resort to actually having a digital uh, uh, cash, it's a big step for the clearing banks. Uh, first, because I don't think they're sure on how they can operate it and what impact it's going to have on the economy. And, and that's one side. On the other side, it's quite obvious that if you have a digital cash, it's easier to have more information and control the, the, the system. So there's pros and cons to, to central banks doing it. From a point of view of someone who is more into uh, crypto and everything, I see it as a potential threat because it's really easy to misuse it. So if you see the pilots that are happening in China, um, once China issues their own uh, private currency, they will have complete control over whatever happens to the, uh, to the, to the population. So, you know, you can ban someone from taking a train or a bus and uh, it can go to that extreme. I'm not sure that's the case for the Western world. But there's always that, uh, that danger. What is the central bank going to do once, once all the cash is no longer anonymous, basically? And, and that, that's what usually happens when you go for CBDC now. Yeah, maybe we should rewind for a second. So CBDC, if you could just explain the concept and, and, and what the, maybe the, the rollout plan is for China, who's been a little bit more predictable in how they're and more aggressive in their investment of rolling out a CBDC. And I, as far as I know, they're the only country that's like, heavily investing and in, in planning to build this out. Other countries, the U.S. included, seem to be talking about it, but yeah. a central bank digital currency is effectively the idea of a like crypto, crypto project uh, tied to the fiat dollar, but yeah. separate from like Tether or USDC. And that's, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, so the main, main question is who, the, who, who issues the, the currency, you know? And when you look at the traditional economy, like the central bank is issuing the, the M zero, like the actual paper currency that we have in our hands, no, and they control that part of the currency. The rest of what is most of money is issued by the retail banks. So, um, uh, the retail bank is the one who issues a loan and in that way issues money. So you have those two steps and then many, many more steps on how money works today. So, so basically the idea behind uh, CBDC is that you can, um, issue, uh, instead of paper currency, a digital cash. Um, which can then, uh, be uh, similar to cash interchangeable, hopefully anonymous, but uh, in most cases, when I see the proposal CBDCs, you can actually track it and then, uh, digitalize it, but has those, have those balances in the central bank instead of the bank. So the one that owes you the money for that CBDC would be the central bank and not the bank itself. So, so it's a very, very big change and, and, and nobody knows really what's going to happen. There are a lot of positive benefits. A lot of the central banks see it more as an easier way to do cross-border payments. At least that's the discussions we're having with the central bank here. And they see like a potential, uh, uh, central bank digital currency, an easier way to do cross-border settlement, but not the very few countries are actually moving the step towards doing one, uh, locally and replacing cash. Probably north of Europe is closer because in a way it's very similar to, to what we're talking about. Uh, Canada is evaluating it and like you said, China, but, um, there's few initiatives in the Caribbean, but it's still very, very early now. And, and the general things to be aware of is that unlike the current system in the U S the federal reserve determines interest rates that they issue like M zero, which goes mm -hmm. to the banks in the case of a CBDC central bank digital currency, this is going to be issued on chain, but there's still effectively one account with one secret key that has the ability to issue new currency. So how Bitcoin issues new currency is that after so many, uh, blocks and somebody, so many, yeah, blocks, there's, uh, there's kind of a predict, very predictable quantitative graph showing the total number of Bitcoin that are going to be released. And the major appeal of Bitcoin is exactly that is the, 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 the volume of currency that's going to be released and the total amount released is hard coded into the protocol that everyone uses. So you can't change it. Unlike the, you know, certainly unlike the current system in the, at least in the U S is the federal reserve could print a, a trillion dollars tomorrow mm -hmm. if they wanted to, they, they still could under CBDC. So practically yeah. speaking, what, how does control change controls of the, of the currency of the currency supply stays the same. Yeah. What changes? Yeah. So, so it's a good point because, um, 
basically the key point is that they issue all the currency. So they're the ones who are moving the economy, which is the central bank. And it's the case for most of the countries in the world. Like uh, almost all the world adopted a similar model to the Fed, uh, even here in, in Colombia. No? I think the change is that you still have some uh, control of, uh, of your own money when you have a dollar bill, because in a way, yes, they determine the value of it. But it's anonymous, you can keep it, you can change it, you can actually transact in an anonymous way with something that is uh, uh, widely accepted as a medium of exchange. No? Uh, once you digitalize it, then basically you have a full tracking of where the money is moving uh, in, in the economy. No? And, and I'm not saying that everybody would like to stay anonymous, but there is that, that component that at least uh, a cash bill gives you because it's completely interchangeable and, and there is no, it's untraceable. No? And CBDC is in, on a borderline digitalizing cash, cash and making something that was really convenient and untraceable, completely traceable in the whole whole system. So so there is benefits to it for the economy, but then again, you know, I have to balance out uh, the benefits to the economy and uh, the rights of each individual person for the privacy, you know? Yeah, well, that's my concern, and but yeah. The rights of the individual person seem to be that if there is a blockchain, ironically, uh, that on blockchain with CBDC, that the, the the fact that it's fully transparent is most most tempting to the government because now they have more control. Like China's incentivized to do this because they have the ability to what shut down certain wallets. Like, what are the actual root privileges that a uh, central bank or government would have on behalf of CBDC? What can they do, practically speaking, that you you couldn't do with the current fiat system? Yeah, I think I, it's hard to say for China. I've seen some of the papers, and and our chief architect, who is quite a quite a personality, Minka, he 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 lived in, he lived in China for a long time. So we have had a lot of uh, direct feedback on what is going on, and uh, and the WeChat, and the, and the cool things that are happening there. But the, the the risk I see is that they're already doing that even with the uh, with the cards because they have their own private card system, which is not Visa or Mastercard. No, so people who are not uh, politically correct in their opinion get blocked of uh, their money wasn't accepted anymore in certain places. No, so they literally can can limit uh, with whom you can interact. And money, in a way, is a language which you use to interact with most people. And as long as it's uh, completely interchangeable, you can interact with anyone. Once you limit that. Uh, the government has a lot of control. So, so that's the risk for China. But I, I think that the Western world is a bit different. They're more worried about high cash usage and the inconvenience of cash than they are about uh, uh, privacy. You know? So I think China is a bit of an extreme example. You know? Yeah. I'd imagine. So if you, if you picture the extreme, I mean, China is just overtly centralized and overtly yeah. actively involved between the government and, and uh, individual people's lives and, and companies. So they could write into the code that China's wallet or China's access permissions give them the ability to shut down or take, yeah. you know, money directly from people's accounts and they wouldn't have to go through banks. So the U.S. effectively has has the same right privileges today in that they can go to a bank, they can audit the bank, they can shut down an account if they believe, you know, whatever they believe and they want to. Yeah. But they still, it's still a process. Whereas I would imagine if you built the system in a certain way where the government then has instantaneous ability to shut down any wallet, move money back. Security decreases, transparency yep. increases, but for the benefit of the government to see where every dollar in circulation is. Do you think the, the Western world adopts a, a, an approach that is beneficial for people that doesn't give the temptation to the government to shut down accounts? Like what would be the formula that works for the West? Yeah, so, so I would include Latin America here in the West because people usually do yeah. the U.S. and the U.S., you know, have a high penetration of financial services, credit to access to credit is really easy. When you look at the most of the world, and especially Colombia, where I am right now, no, most of the people are invisible. And, and the downside of using cash, it's not just that, uh, yes, in, it's inconvenient, you carry it, you can, it can be stolen, but the biggest inconvenience is that you're completely invisible to the system, you know? So most of the people, and I'm saying a uh, large part of the population don't have access to financial services. So maybe they open an account to receive some subsidies, but actually when they need to, to get a credit or loan because either their kid is sick or they can't pay their uh, utility bill at the end of the month, they're invisible. No? So the benefit of uh, enabling money to move digitally and fast, good example is India, Brazil, and now Colombia, because 
as soon as you enable it to move uh, freely in a way that you can move it instantly low cost, then uh, people first have more visibility and then other companies start building additional service on top of it. No? Okay, now I have a history of transactions, now I can offer you credit, now I can offer you what is happening in Colombia, savings in USDC, now I can offer you like additional products which weren't available before. So the big problem of most of the world is access to financial services and cash isn't doing a good job in that sense because uh, it keeps a lot of the population mm -hmm. visible. So that, that's the plus side of in general, I think it can be solved with just a real-time payment system. There's no need to go to a CBDC model. And as long as you have a system where everyone is dropperable, you have this benefit for the economy for the long term. No? Is a place like Colombia who uses such high percentage of cash transactions, are, are people generally motivated by the uh, the fact that they're anonymous when making these transactions, or are they are they using cash strictly because there aren't better options available? Yeah, it's a bit of both. I actually had that perception when I came here, and I'm like, yeah, everybody's using cash because they just want to stay anonymous. But then when you realize that when I tried to pay my next door neighbor, you know, I said like, yeah, I prefer to use my phone and send it. And you know, for a, for a five dollar transaction at that time, it was like four dollars to pay for the transaction, and it didn't come. It was three days and still didn't arrive. So, yeah. so it was super inconvenient. So I think that when you give people a, a very convenient option to digitally move money, they they switch to it. So so convenience is is uh, is quite important, and especially once we had the pandemic, a lot of the businesses were there was a lockdown also here, so a lot of the businesses couldn't accept cash anymore. So there was a large interest in actually uh, receiving some type of digital digital payment. Mm -hmm. So so there is a place for uh, uh, for digital cash, or I would say like digital yeah. transactions, not to call it cash. Yeah. And, and what do you think is the like if you're designing the system, which you know you you are, and certainly playing a large role into it? What do you think are the proper mechanisms to push as a as as people that are you know influencing the decisions of the government to build a system like this? Certainly you don't want to, it seems like you don't want to, we don't want to allow the government to be tempted. You know, you don't want to even have them, the you know, one thing Apple did, right, I think, was they built the iPhone that's so much of this, the information, the data is stored on your phone cryptographically. So if the government came to Apple, they cannot access it. Like technically yeah. they can't. So therefore th that's the end of the conversation. You know, it's like actually on Dom's phone or on your computer. Is there a way that we can architect this so that the governments can't even be tempted? Because we know, given enough time, pandemics, emergencies, governments tend to overreach dramatically and then they pull back 10% from that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think that uh, a lot of the conversations we have with central banks is actually good because they are looking at um, crypto and they're looking at this asymmetric photography, you know, and, and it's beautiful, you know, like asymmetric photography is a huge step forward because like they say, not your keys, not your money, you know? So if there is a way for people to hold their keys, even if it's a CBDC, in a way you're mi mi migrating the risk, you know, because only the holder of the key can actually make the transaction and make use of the funds. So they can receive all the money. It's, I, I was, for a long time, I was wondering why, why did they use this system with the UTXO and, and digital signatures in Bitcoin? I realized that, you know, um, receiving transactions, it's, most common use case and you receive them in a bucket, you know, you just receive them to my address. You don't have to worry. You actually need to sign it when you send money. So, so if, if, uh, they adopt the idea of, uh, people being able to hold their own private keys, that would be a fantastic system. So that would be like a, a system because there is a need for an additional layer. Uh, I think Bitcoin solves the, the key point of a settlement currency. And, and, uh, I think the block size wars already decided that, that it's basically a replacement for gold, which is fantastic, you know, but you have layers and layers of, uh, of, uh, uh, that, that need to be resolved. So we need to we need to retract. There needs to be a simple way to keep track of our depths. And I think this clearing layer is what is missing and it's going to be built in next year. So it could be the central bank that builds it interoperably and using those principles or it could be private initiatives, like the ones we're doing with the uh, ACH Colombia, which is the local ACH here. And, and what do you think the, the chances are that, it, that the mechanism for cash transactions essentially being speed, right? Bitcoin is more expensive and slower. So if you're going to buy a coffee, people are not using Bitcoin. They're thinking of it, like you said, as a replacement to gold. Is there a potential that people branch off from government controlled currencies in the cash layer? I mean, the, the, that, that seems to be the whole idea then yeah. of the crypto community is like, 
get away from the government's ability to control monetary supply because that then, you know, creates inflation, unnecessarily warps the market. It, it's really not, it's like, you know, stopping at a gas station along the way to the destination. It doesn't seem to be in line with the destination. Do you see it being still an open debate as to how this rolls out? Like, do you see it as an inevitability that it becomes layer two, like a lightning protocol on Bitcoin or, cause that, this seems like to me, at least it seems like the most unsettled major aspect of the actual monetary adoption yeah. of, of crypto. Yeah, th th that's a great point. So, so, um, our vision is that they would ever coexist, you know, so. Uh, I don't think you can change the whole monetary system we have in a, in a, not even in a mm -hmm. 10 years or 15 years. Our ago. lifetime. Not, not, maybe not even in our lifetime, but they will coexist. There's more and more people actually relying on Bitcoin. I'm probably one of them because, uh, I am more in the traditional uh, payment space, but, uh, I, I'm a true believer that, uh, that, that is a way to be dependent from the, from the government control. So, so what we're seeing and, and what is our kind of long-term plan, we're doing a lot of, uh, um, first access to financial institutions. So we have read and write this last mile is the biggest problem of crypto to me, because even you have an exchange bank, won't open you an account, you need uh, you need a way to convert fiat to, to crypto. So what Minka is, start, is doing now in a few countries and we're doing it in Europe too, we're doing this last mile rails. So we can actually uh, read and write to a bank account. Once we can do that, the idea is that, uh, um, there can be a bank who is willing to sponsor it, that you can actually convert that to lightning or convert it to Bitcoin. So you can hold part of your funds in the same wallet. Part of it will be backed by Bitcoin. Part, part of it will be fiat, which is acceptable through the Transfija network, which we built. It's called Transfija. So, so I think this is the direction where things will go. I, I can't say for sure. I think that CBDC is still too early, but probably it's going to be a, a competition of both and both will coexist and uh, they will have different use cases. No? Yeah. And do you think, so CBDC, CBDC certainly seems like it'll be a pathway forward for governments on blockchain. They're sitting around thinking, okay, this presents a major threat to our society. I'm sure there's going to be that narrative internally in governments. We need to do something about this. We're not going to ban it. It's too late, you know, one. And yeah. two is we can actually, uh, inc we can improve the things that we care about, which is control over the supply, visibility into supply, seeing data on the transaction volume. Like there's all sorts of maybe upsides for the government's perspective, certainly control being one of them, at least overtly in China and, and probably other places. People certainly have a conflict of interest when it comes to the, the government, because you want, like, I want people to pay taxes so I can drive on roads and we can fund police officers. And so on some level, like I want people to be accountable. I want the government to have the ability to audit people so people aren't you know, avoiding taxes and collecting taxes is like the one thing the government will die on a hill before they give up that right. Right. <laughs> like yeah, that's, yeah. that's like the, the animal is going to fight to the death to breathe, you know, before everything else. So tax collection seems like it's got to be top of the hierarchy of things that a government cares about above pretty much all else. So mechanisms of tax collection under crypto, uh, are a big conversation and, and yeah. there's companies, founders I've interviewed that build companies specifically to allow people to pay taxes. I'm sure the government's going to spend a lot of money on auditing people and creating tools to audit people in crypto. Bitcoin and, and other cryptos are public. There's some that are like cryptographically private, like yeah. Monero and Zcash and others. Do, do you think it's just going to continue to be kind of a wild west on what different currencies people use and then governments just kind of offer an alternative? Because it, it feels to me like the tectonic plates are shifting but mm -hmm. we're not settled because it's like, yeah. if I can use the US dollar and USDC and Tether, and then the government makes a coin and now I'm using like Bitcoin lightning network, like, I don't know. I mean, there's some reason why the world adopts USD as kind of the single protocol that we all agree on for uh, currency exchange. And it seems to be valuable to be on one, one yeah. protocol. I don't know. Yeah, I think you have a point there because it's going to be both. That's what I mentioned before. And mm -hmm. uh, um, I think there's room for both, but, but but I think what is also the positive side, maybe not to to go deep into this uh, anarchist idea. And also the, the thing that we've seen the benefit from real-time payments, because maybe you don't even need that central bank digital currency. You need just a good initiative, private or public, to make real-time payments interoperable. So as long as it doesn't matter if you hold balances in a blue bank or red bank and you can exchange them, uh, oh, 
near uh, without nearly without cost and nearly with real time uh, that over that enables money to flow and then there's a hu huge benefit for the whole of the economy so so it's it's there is direct correlation you know when you look at india kenya is a good example uh, brazil colombia now so everywhere where you enable like a real time payment system uh, there is benefit for the wild population wider population for the uh, for the whole economy so i think that's the key point so it, once they see that they can move that into a step higher and digitalize the cash, I, I think it will still coexist, at least the countries yeah. where we are really. But we'll see. Like you said, the, the, the things are shifting and they're still going to settle, yeah. What are the factors that play into uh, whether it's appealing for Minka or, or like I think of the leapfro leapfrogging effect where, you know, countries who haven't invested like India in uh, telephone system, telephone wires all over the place, then they adopt cell phones and they almost yeah. have a, strategic advantage that they haven't invested in all this infrastructure that's no longer being used. Like, do you think there's advantages for countries who have um, a banking system and payment network that just isn't evolved at all, that they can just basically short run all of that stuff that we that we built, like in the US, for instance, and just say, hey, let's go crypto first. Is that something we might see? Or are you, you guys thinking about that? Yeah, we are. We are talking. I mean, it's not just Latin. We, we are talking to a lot of countries in Latin America. Like I said, our focus is central banks, clearing houses, yeah. and we work with banks directly. And we're talking to a lot of countries in Africa. And I think that's exactly the 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 case in the U.S. When you look at the the ACH and then all the layers, and uh, it's really like a money. You have like 15, yeah. 20, 30 layers, and it seems like in real time, but actually, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's uh, 1950s under the hood now. So, so uh, it, uh, US is a good example where everything was built layer to layer for a long period of time through private players. No, but if some country which which uh, just wants to leapfrog decides to use a much more technology, lightweight integration or a protocol, they could actually do something of the same effect as Venmo, Zelle, Cashmere, or something, in in a very short period of time and a fraction of the cost. So. So I think that that's, that's probably going to be happening in the next two, three years. There will be more and more clearing houses and central banks who will realize that, that there is a benefit for the economy and we can maybe leapfrog the, the 15, 20 years of protocols and building up uh, technology stacks. Yeah. Can I ask you a little bit about this ACH system? This is such a yeah. mystery to so many people, myself included. You mentioned that in the US, the ACH system, uh, I think it stands for auto clearing house. Automate. It is a automated clearinghouse. It's a file system using very old technology. So they, what kind of files are they sending? Who's sending them and what are they, what's in these files? Yeah, you, you don't want to go there. I mean, I was completely shocked when I saw it, you know, it's when I say pre-internet, I literally mean pre-internet, you know, so it's like, there's a standard called NACHA. I think it's like North American standard. And it's a literal file where you have the checksums. So you have some amounts from to then and the checksum. So it's a file that's been used from the seventies, I think. Uh, it was then adopted from there to the cards use a similar system, which is called ISO 8583, you know, but this file system is interesting because what usually happens is that all the banks collect that information to a file and then two or three times a day, they actually prepare that file and send it to a secure system. There were literally banks here that were sending the file with couriers, you know, in, in, uh, in Colombia, but of course they're sending it now to FTPs and safe trend, but what you end up with, uh, files from 15 banks with uh, hundreds of millions of transactions and someone needs to conciliate that. So it's half manual, but uh, the banks don't trust the ACH. So almost all the banks in the US, in Colombia, have a team of people who are validating the checksums. So you have actually, in, in cases of Colombia, we, we went to a bank that had a full floor of people who are just making sure that conciliation is right. So, so that's the reality of the payment system today. Someone is always conciliating. Wow. And <laughs> nobody trusts the 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 traditional uh system so even for the credit cards you have the same process somebody is conciliating each transfer for for every card process you have there's either a batch or there's a person checking that uh that the numbers match no but that's the big it, problem of the system yeah and why why wouldn't it be simplified to just you know sum up all the totals and then only investigate if there's some issue like, yeah, but that's what most of them actually do now. So, so they see that if there's discrepancy between what you say and what I say, but still most of the banks are doing like uh, line by line, they're basically like check summing everything and checking that all the, all the, because you have to understand that during a month, there's like four or five, five files a day. Then there's like 30 days in a month. It, it's a big volume when, when it uh, builds up. 
And the main reason for that is that the protocol which was done with file was the only way to do it in the 70s and 80s. And changing that technology was quite hard, so the people just just rolled with it, you know, and uh, uh, for years, yeah. Yes, I guess it's a rational decision, right? We we criticize it, but it's like, if it costs more to overhaul it and it's more risky and you may not have the team of people to do it and it takes coordination from other banks, it's like, well, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't happen. It's kind of more of a reflection of technology as a whole, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, L last question for you. So you running this company as a someone who's uh, enthusiastic about crypto, you're, you're, you've removed crypto from even mentioning it to the banks. It's, it's not the central appeal. How do you see uh, the way in which Minka can almost covertly uh, influence the banking world to either adopt crypto or like if you had a, a kind of mission below the mission, right? I'm sure yeah. the mainstream mission, make payments, 0% transaction, free, easy for everyone. But then there's also this tension between government control and, and the crypto world, which gives control to the people. Being enthusiastic about crypto, how do you see um, the way in which Minka paves the way for crypto adoption in the world? Yeah, I think still one of the biggest problem is the last mile, no? So, yeah. I, mean, I mean, look at any exchange, big exchanges, I'll make a mention like, like uh, from Coinbase to, to the ones in Europe, and local ones like Bitso, the biggest problem is like how they convert actual last mile to crypto, uh, to fiat, how they convert fiat to crypto and crypto to fiat. No? And, and doing that requires you to connect to those old technologies and to build like long mm -hmm. process. And also the problem is that you need a good sponsor bank. So, so what we're kind of building the system from the ground up. I think that when I saw like Stripe, Stripe policy was like, we will be, build everything except for the last mile because we in a MasterCard already did it. We think that the last mile is not built in Latin America, Africa, and most of Southeast Asia. So we are building that last mile. And the vision is that with time, we will have a huge acceptance. People already used to holding their private keys to launch a, a transfer transaction, which is the ACH local transaction. It will be an easier switch for them now to actually hold uh, Colombian peso and uh, and uh, maybe Bitcoin to Lightning. So we are building the last mile rails. It's uh, uh, like the Super Marios of uh, of the of the crypto world. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, Dom, where where are you? Are you active on Twitter, on uh, LinkedIn, elsewhere that you want to throw out personally? Yeah, uh, it's my name, uh, D L M A G O J, on Twitter and LinkedIn. So uh, if there's any additional questions or people want to contact me, they can feel free to do it through through those means. Yeah. Awesome. And any particular people or books, uh, writers that have influenced you or helped you shape your worldview that you want to throw out there? Oh, yeah, there's, there's pr probably a lot. Uh, um, th there's like part of the entrepreneurship and part of the economy. So I, I went really deep into the Austrian economy, you know, from Hive to, and, and that's maybe the bit of an influence of, of the way that I, that I see the opinion. Uh, but there's, a, I think it's James Gleck with the two books, which is Information and Chaos. And I think it's super recommended just to understand, have a bit of deeper understanding of technology and how it affects everything else in the world. So I think information probably is one of the best books that I read uh, recently. Oh, check that out. Thanks so much, Tom. This is awesome chat with you. Congrats on all the progress of Minka. Thank you very much, Mike. It was great talking to you and great questions. Cheers. Thank you.